Welcome to Webinar 5, Enrichment and Outreach for Collections. We will hear presentations on three ongoing projects. First is Hugo Manginias on Enriching Europeana. Hugo is product owner for APIs at Europeana Foundation. He is involved in the elaboration of requirements and specifications that contribute to the further development of the Europeana data model. Secondly is Alvin Larsson with St. George on a Bike, Artificial Intelligence and Improving the Quality and Quantity of Metadata. Alvin works with research and development at Europeana, focusing on data quality and enrichment. And thirdly, Larissa Bork will tell us how to boost your collections reach on external platforms. Larissa is Communications Coordinator at the Swedish National Heritage Board for the Europeana Common Culture Project. She designs and executes strategies for increased data quality of collections in SOC, the Swedish Open Cultural Heritage Aggregator, of which we will hear more of in Webinar 6. Hello, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Hugo Maginhas from Europeana. Um, in this webinar, uh, I would like to show a crowdsourcing um, platform uh, and tool uh, for transcribing documents. Um, I would like to start the, 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 um, the presentation with a short introduction about uh, Transcribaton, the platform that, that I'll be talking about. Uh, I felt that this gives a really good introduction to um, to the to the scope of the um, of the tool. Can you read what they wrote a hundred years ago? Are you interested in history? Learn about the war that shaped Europe from the words of the people who lived through it. Help make Europe's heritage available to all by bringing letters, diaries and postcards written during World War I back to life. It's fun, interactive, competitive and addictive. Compete and measure your progress against participants from across the world. Sounds good, it's easy and free. Go to transcribathon.eu and read our helpful tutorials. Then choose your stories. Take part in Transcribathon anywhere, anytime. Go to transcribathon.eu. Ready, steady, transcribe. Hello, you enjoyed the video. Um, very recently, uh, a project um, uh, uh, has, has been worked on improving the, the, um, the platform. Uh, this problem, a project ran for 18 months um, with the, the improvements in mind was to open transcriptions to other content beyond the, the 1418 collection, which uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, where actually the, the transcription uh, started, started with World War I uh, transcription of World War I uh, documents. Also to improve the, the experience for transcribers, um, support enrichment uh, via both manual but also um, um, user-assisted automated tasks. Uh, also make transcriptions and enrichments available in European. Um, and also promote the platform uh, for uh, transcriptions via Transcribaton events. Um, the interface uh, for transcription uh, looks as, as what I'm showing on the left side. Uh, you'll see the documents that you're transcribing. Uh, on the right side, you can uh, see the, the, the you can write the what you see in the in the left side. You can also uh, add uh, style information to the documents um, uh, in case to make it more uh, closer as possible to the to the look of the text. Um, you can also specify the language. Uh, it's uh, displayed uh, side by side, uh, which is typical. The, display for, um, for for transcription. You can also have it in overlay, um, have an image on top and, 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 and bottom, so you can choose from several layouts. Um, also, and I show, one of the additions of the, the, um, the improvements in terms of the user in, inter, interface uh, has been the, the adoption of IIIF. Um, one of the, the, the um, uh, the, the additions to the platform is that new documents, when they are added, uh, they are converted for 
for example, if they are a PDF, um, they are split into the isolated pages, uh, into images, and they are stored in a F server, which can then uh, power a display uh, and allow uh, deep zoom uh, on a page, as you can see on, on the right side, but you can also very quickly span and uh, um, across the pages. This allows for the transcriber to look, especially for example, in this case, to look very, very close to the, to the to the document, see exactly what, or, or try to understand better the, um, the handwritten uh, text and the helping the, the um, uh, making the transcriptions. Uh, one of the, the, the additions of, of that this project uh, brought was uh, also um, the, the, the adding descriptions to the to the to the items to the documents. Uh, also um, indicating topics or persons uh, from linked data vocabularies that are relevant for the, for that document. Um, names of persons that are. Um, um, uh, name, uh, mentioned uh, quite often in the document and they are relevant. Uh, also adding ge geospatial information, uh, as you can see on the, on the top right corner. Um, also keywords um, uh, for the document with the main uh, topics um, in it, but also references to other sources that can, uh, um, that may be, be relevant to that document. One other feature that was developed uh, was the ability for automatically identifying the um, um, references in the text. Uh, so here, for example, you can see on the on the left side you'll see a transcription uh, made, and you see the um, the, the the tool automated uh, name native recognition recognized uh, a place, uh, Krakow, but also a person, um, and then the the, um, the transcriber can uh, choose uh, the enrichments that are valid and then they could be um, added to the, uh, to, to the item. I will show now uh, uh, a demo of, of the tool. Um, this you can find online. Uh, you can click on the transcribe now. So here you'll see all the, the collections that have been um, added to the platform. Um, these collections are added, um, they are selected and added uh, uh, beforehand. Um, in this case, I will choose one item to transcribe. I'll choose this one, is the one as well that I, I used for the presentation. And here you can see uh, the progress of the of the of the transcription. Several uh, transcribers can work on on the same documents at the same time. Uh, there's also um, a review process uh, after the the um, a transcriber marks has done a page. Uh, it goes by a reviewer. A reviewer is a user that is uh, nominated to. To, to do so and uh, you make sure that everything, the document has been completed uh, and also verifies that um, everything has been uh, filled in in the right, uh, in the right um, place. After review progress, the process, they are, they are marked as completed and, and done for, for transcription. Here you can see this, this is the whole, by the way, the, um, all the items they are um, they grouped together in named as stories, and each story is composed of several pages. Uh, could be several pages of a document, but can also be uh, a letter, uh, um, a postcard together as part of one only story. I'll pick this one, the first page. So in this case, it's a, a transcription that has been worked on already. Uh, there is a transcription here of the text. I can go into a, a better transcription, go to the description mode. And in this case, I can look side by side uh, with the display that I showed before. 
I can also switch display and have um, an overlay. Also have it in the bottom, having on the side and overlay in case I want to see, um, to be able to have the whole screen to explore the image. I can zoom, have a deep zoom and check the, 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 the handwritten text. Make sure that I, I, I read it well and I can describe it. Here, I can also set the language. In this case, it's, it's set to German. And I can also say which kind of, of, of item it is. If it's a written text printed, also say if it's a postcard photo. These are typically the use cases from that are present in the, um, in the, in, in the data. Um, more uh, kinds of items could be added. Here, when it comes to enrichment, uh, I can add a location. Here I can search, for example, for Berlin. Uh, and I can add it. I will not add it because it, because it does, doesn't make sense for this item. But I, could, uh, I can also tag it here, specify the, the date of the document. Also uh, refer to the uh, persons that are referred in the document that are relevant. Also add keywords and also sources that where I can add a link and also a description for that source. And you can see all the, the documents. You can also see marked the ones that have, uh, depending on the description status, um, in orange is in, in, in review um, and yellow in edit. Completed will be green and they are closed then for, trans for transcription. Um, so far, you can also have a look at the number of items that have been trans transcribed at the moment. There are 300 and around 320,000 documents already in the platform and more uh, documents will be added for, for transcription in the next, uh, um, as new campaigns are, 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 are launched. Uh, so far we have around 30,000 million characters, but um, in the enrichments in around 73,000. With that, I finish my presentation item for the Transcribeton. Thank you for, for joining. Thank you, Hugo. Uh, so we can uh, uh, have a bit of a Q&A uh, and you can maybe stop sharing uh, the screen. Uh, so I'm just going to make sure that we have gallery view. So we uh, do have one uh, Q&A uh, right now, a uh, question from Shackleton. Uh, how do you insert diary? Can it be used by a group to analyze? Can you, can you repeat the question? Uh, so the question is, how do you insert diary? Uh, can it be used by a group to analyze? Um, diary you know, do you mean how can I I can transcribe a diary or an existing existing diary or? Well, it could be that what he is. Uh, yeah, but maybe like the the question maybe uh, also was like, can I uh, something that is uh, included? Can it be sort of used by a group to analyze and and transcribe uh, or? Can only one person. Many many users can describe at the same time. Yes. Uh, a document uh, actually in that document, um, many users have, have have transcribed different pages, especially mm -hmm. because there does there are uh, quite quite a lot of but pages you, in that yeah. item. Yeah, and is it? Uh, but someone uh, you, you get these the, the the things that can be transcribed. Which ones are chosen that can be can anything at in the Europeana collections that. Rather, the collections belong to other museums, but can anything that has been aggregated by Europeana been yeah. being transcribed? 
potentially yes, even though the, now it's restricted uh, for, for depending on the license. All the open license content um, uh, was added to the platform, and and this um, and 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 to be added on the platform, this is made by um, uh, the the data needs to be to, to be prepared. So we will make a selection. They will get uploaded to the platform. It also needs because of the the triple IF uh, display it needs to be processed pre-processed in order before an actual transcriber can can go to the platform and start transcribing. Yeah. Uh, so this is made by a, a selection. Uh, so far, we have selected uh, based on the campaigns we have. We have originally the fourteen eighteen, so all that content can be transcribed. Uh, also, all that content is openly licensed. Um, then also the 1989 uh, campaign also is is available for transcription. So and uh, also there has been another one also available. But this is made by a, by a selection uh, beforehand of openly licensed contents that will have that will make sense for to be transcribed. Yeah. And and when you, for instance, when you have something like a diary or a book or something, uh, the que another question from Shackleton is: Is it like uh, page by page, is each page individually added, or is it? Each each page individually will be transcribed. Yes. Um, mm. As as you, as you saw in the to in the top, um, I could scroll along all the pages. I, put, mm. I picked the first one, uh, but you could select um, the other pages that make up the document. Mm. Oh, and actually, all those pages they make up. Um, it's, it's mentioned storage because it's, it's aligned with the 1418 uh, content, which is around the story. So, uh, a story of, of a soldier, uh, and then you have a diary. You could have uh, letters. You could have photographs. All of that part of the same story, and uh, and each one uh, represented as a separate document. And how, uh, and these transcribatons that you have. Um, are you sort of actively getting in touch with certain communities or is it that people just fi find them and, and contribute? Are you working sort of saying, okay, we have this material, we know that there are good pe you know, people working on this kind of history or this kind of material or how, how, how do people find their way to the transcribatons? There we have a call for for actions, but um, it also will uh, will will happen uh, in, um, uh, in 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 a venue. So um, we'll have to describe some events happening in a, in a specific location. Well, we 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 work with institutions uh, locally, um, and they will also work with them to 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 share uh, and 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 bring the transcribers. Uh, to the to the to the to the transcription event. Great. So a final question from Anna Svensson is: uh, How are the campaigns chosen, and what is what is the next campaign, or what are you working on right now? At the moment, we don't have. Um, I I don't I don't we don't have a campaign, if if I recall right. Um, what what. I don't. I don't know if we have any campaign at the moment. No. Okay. It, it's all the documents are open. Open for 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 being transcribed. Uh, yeah. All the campaigns happen during the the project. Um, now, since the project actually finished finished officially at the end of February, uh, but there were still uh, uh, some um, some more being done afterwards. Uh, but um, with that, the the campaigns. Um, have, uh, have have stopped. More may may come in the in the next uh, months, mm. and and some of them may may come as as a result of new projects, new 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 funding. Yeah. Oh, hopefully, uh, I got one more uh, question here that I can just throw out to you from Anna Groundwater. Uh, does this in any way interact with uh, the museum? London crowdsourcing project Operation War Diary, or is it something, or or does it interact in any way with the? the are you uh, familiar with the uh, the Museum of London crowdsourcing project Operation War Diary? Uh, mm, no, I'm not not familiar no. with uh, with with that project. 
Good, thank you. It's really, and hopefully we'll have time to sort of sum up and, and get back to some of the questions in the end, but uh, we have to move on to Albin right now, who's going to tell us about the next project. So Albin, you can turn on your uh, video and then you can share your screen. Um, I will be presenting an AI enrichment project targeting European cultural heritage collection that is very much uh, work in progress. Uh, it's currently running. I would however like to start by making a note as some of my previously, my, some of my previous work has been presented in author presentations during this webinar series. I am doing this as a part of the research and development team at Europeana. As I also mentioned earlier, I was previously, previously working with the SOC team. Uh, now to the St. George of the Bike Project. This is an ongoing project that runs from September 2019 to August 2022. It is very much in partnership with the Barcelona Supercomputer Center. And that brings a lot of the ex expertise regarding AI and computer vision to this project. Um, this project is also entirely research and development focused. However, the results are likely to impact production services and content. Currently, the project is very much of in an experimental phase and it's very much being around computer vision and image analysis. And before jumping into use cases and challenges, I would like to show an example. So it's a little easy, easier to relate to this concept. Um, so here's a typical example of the output we imagine. We can see a couple of objects being identified in this painting, including three ships as being labeled as boats. We can see flags being identified as banners and so on. Um, this example is actually from the port itself, from the experimental phase of the port. Um, also note that each object has a bounding box surrounding it, so we know where in the painting this specific object is. We can also see that while well, it is fine, some of the flags and some of the ships, it hasn't found all of them. So there are multiple use cases for this data that we intend to generate. One of them is being discoverability and being able to find data more easily. And especially regarding search, for example, if the painting shown earlier doesn't have ship or boat mentioned in its description, it's currently tricky to find. But by using this type of technology, we can extract data and make it searchable. And this doesn't only help search on the Europeana.ea website, but it can also help author external services using Europeana data and the data from the providers. Uh, for example, this would of course be available in the Europeana APIs. Uh, another very relevant use case is that we intend to share this data on research and open data platforms. Some of the ones being considered include GeoDAPT, European Open Science Cloud, Kaggle, and similar ones. Uh, it would be great if you have any experience with this in your field of work that you could just say something to us about your experience with them because we haven't yet decided which ones we're going to share data with. Um, some of the challenges when we do this is among orchard that this data we have and this data we need doesn't necessarily match up. So there is limitations to existing data and as well as a problem regarding quality assurance and provenance representation. How do we ensure that this is correct without too much effort and how do we ensure that we keep the provenance representation somewhere? I won't go into the later very much because it's very much not a part of this project, but rather being a part of more larger efforts at Europeana regarding enrichments in general. So the data limitations. I would like to start with that the data that cutter hedge institutions have today do not necessarily it's the same data as we need to do AI and object detection on it. 
For example, uh, a description of an object might not necessarily be a visual description of the object. It might very much be the story behind the object or something else. And that is totally okay, but it doesn't help us with this type of challenges. We also have things like multilingual data that we have to deal with. Okay, we have a ship mentioned here in several languages, and we need this data to be able to, be able to train AI, AI on detection. Uh, but we need to overcome this type of challenges. And this includes a lot of auto-relevant work as well as multilingual search and so on. And then one of the things are actually this bonding box I showed earlier, that we need this data to be able to do object detection. And this data is nothing that really cultural heritage institutions collect today. So it's something we have to do. Uh, we can do that with crowdsourcing and things like that. So it's a bit of new work and a new area for many cultural heritage. Very few institutions have done such efforts. And then we have this challenge of quality assurance, especially with AI that might have been trained on various types of data and a very diverse set of data as there are a lot of institutions in Europeana. How do we ensure that this is of the right quality? And in general, the idea is to have humans in the loop. And this can, this can mean several things. It can mean that we put crowdsourcing here to do the validation. We invite people to, yeah, is this okay? It, and then it might also be that we, we're quite sure about something and might do samples. We have this collection. We know that this model, AI model, is good at detecting ships. So we might just do sample set. And, okay, this works very well. And then we have another way of doing it uh, that might be also be relevant. Uh, these are all consideration at the moment. And that is by detecting error patterns. Like we can see by statistics that this collection, something stands out. It's unlikely that we will find bike in a thousand year old artwork and so on. Uh, I would like to show a couple of examples, all from this uh, experimental phase, uh, just to give you a picture of what type of data we envision. Here we have a painting. We see two correct object detections, as well as these pieces of documents under this person's hand being tagged as book. It's one of those typical things that might happen. We have a set of papers here that doesn't necessarily, it isn't necessarily easy to quickly see even for me that this isn't a book. So the AI here I've tagged it with book, but it's rather a set of documents or a letter or something like that. Here we've got something very interesting, I believe. We've got a painting and it has tagged a lot of sheep, not as many as there is there but it has also tagged the person as shepherd. And this is very interesting because the fact that it's being sheep in the picture indicates also that if there is a person in this, it might very well be a shepherd. Um, but all the examples I've shown so far are only on paintings and the scope is actually larger. But even if I stick to the scope we have, it might be very interesting to realize that uh, art is very diverse. So moving on, there is actually an example here that doesn't get much right at all. It's similar to the previous one that there are sheep in this picture, for example, but because this is a impressionism artwork, it, it total, the AI model totally fails to catch things. It says cat, it says book, it says book again, it says angel, and none of those things are present in the image. And when I say, would it, this has been tagged a book, or this has been tagged a ship, or even as I mentioned in the very first example, I said this ship has been tagged as boat. This is actually very much of an opportunity because when we imagine labeling data this way, we imagine connecting it to a concept URI, for example, as given here, person being represented by a big data entity. This means that we could use this, for example, to improve search that, okay, this has been lab labeled as boat, but we know that the synonym to boat is also ship and so on. So we can actually allow people to search by any of those things. It also helps with things like multilingual things. 
this is already very common when enrichment is done in your piano, but it applies here as well. And that is very much my presentation. Great. Thank you, Albin. That's good. Then we have time for some questions. Uh, and there's a nice bike. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm going to start by sort of asking you because I was thinking uh, thinking a bit, well, like you said that, for instance, with the sort of other type of art uh, work, uh, they can sometimes be uh, what's rather funny. I start thinking maybe there is an angel there, but I was also thinking like the, the very specific painting of the cardinal or 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 something something that have you thought about sort of doing it the other way around, like looking at images like this because there were several things that weren't caught, like for instance specific types of clothing or jewelry and things like that, and sort of working in the other way. Of, of teaching it like and then see can you find something similar on other paintings right so actually what is currently being done is that we have a, a few selected vocabulary so we have 46 terms i believe or something like that that we're currently looking for for example we are actively looking for book because mm. we have to for each of these terms we have to create this bombing box mm. so we have to start but with a lot of paintings that we believe include book and then mark this square out so we can't really do it all the way around we can look at what are common terms what would be very useful terms and so on uh, but we have to start from this control yeah. list for now yes uh, we have a question here from uh, Johanna uh, you showed some nice art pieces here but have you tried out the same on photography is that somewhat easier or trickier than paintings so we haven't yet because it's very early in this project and it's experimental, but it's very much the intention. Uh, I wouldn't say it's easier to trickier. There are various challenges. Um, you would probably not apply the same type of rules and so on. But the thing with art is often that it's very much intended to be visual, uh, while generic photographs might not be. So I imagine that actually artworks would be easier, uh, but I'm not an expert on the topic. Yes, no, but it's really, it feels like this, this is something that is a rather wonderful example of what, when you really need to collaborate both with people uh, that have uh, have this technology and people that has can help with sort of checking because until something is perfected, maybe in a hundred years time, it's going to take a lot of time. Uh, so uh, we have a, a question from Magnus Celia here. Uh, what is... Um, is there a long-term vision for this project? Is it learning the technique or is it something bigger? What is the sort of effect that you want to? So there, there are various things. One of the main ones is, as I mentioned, discoverability. Uh, a lot of data today, because sometimes because of the aggregation process, sometimes because of mass digitalizations, very much lack extensive metadata. And the images are very rich of that in some way. So it's making color hedge more sensible, very much like European, one of Europeans go in general. Uh, then of course, it's also a way of working together with the technology partner, knowing this very well, and it's part of the European strategy to very much focused on, on enrichment on AI. Um, so it's yeah. a long-term thing, and therefore we are also working on things like separately with data provenance and things like that. Yeah. Very much building, making sure we can maintain this for a long time. Yeah, because I think that's one of the things that where heritage really has something to give to AI research because it is something that can represent such a wide variety of cultures and time periods. Uh, so it's a major challenge, but it's also something that really forces AI out, out of the comfort zone uh, in, in many ways. But uh, and, and it's quite but it's quite interesting that it's actually worked on that blurry picture of, of the sheep uh, in a way. Yeah. Uh, how, how, what, would, what would you like to see? Like, what would what would be like your uh, your idea? What uh, what AI can be used for in the future for with, with heritage in, in particular? So I, I imagine this is something that I personally imagine it's something that actually can make color hedges more discoverable and possibly cheaper also to do things like digitalization 
uh, what if we can apply this as early as possible in the digitalization process and how much can we save on digitalization mm -hmm. when we combine this type of thing with uh, an expert and the AI is kind of able to help them along the way how much can we actually speed up this digitalization process and being able to dig digitalize much more of European color heritage just because we have this aid. Yeah, exactly. So uh, we have time for one final comment here from Lars. Uh, he says that uh, I know that you are early in the project, but I was thinking of terms like outdoors, summer, sun, sky uh, would also be relevant tags. Um, is it, are those just left out in the project or is it a matter of the quality of the training data, if that is the correct term? But is it that you it have is, to sort of... Yeah, it is very much the correct term. And this is, for example, I mentioned earlier that we're working from a controlled list of vocabularies. We have somewhere around 46 terms. It was the number that popped into my head. And currently when we're experimenting, we are picking those. But we also want to actually be able to use this type of vocabulary to, for example, being able to describe the contents of the painting in a human language. Uh, this is a painting depicting so and so. Uh, and therefore we are, when it's no longer so much experimental as when we are pinning down the use cases, it would be, we need to spend efforts on selecting those classes we will be training the data on. And if the use cases prove that this is the type of thing we need to be able to describe. So they then they, they would be relevant, but not necessarily. Uh, yeah. So we'll give Joanna a sort of final comment here. Yes, that uh, just adding to uh, what was said that the heritage pro uh, sector can provide exceptional amounts of messy data for AI developing to feed the mo uh, models. And uh, so, Really, it's uh, it's quite interesting uh, what uh, uh, the sector can do uh, for Indeed. AI as and well. Especially, especially on this level of aggregation, because aggregation very much helps dealing with some of the challenges that AI applies. Like uh, we get more diverse data, so we avoiding some possibly biases around the data by training data on a lot of content from different institutions. Great. So we have to move on to uh, Larissa now so that we have time for everyone. But thank you very much, Albin. Thank you for having me. Hi, everyone. I hope you hear me and I'm going to share my screen with you. Um, I recognize that some of you already joined us in the last week and I'm really happy to see some faces there are here, see some names at least that I've seen before. So uh, thank you, Hugo and Albin, uh, who showed you that all showed you all what we can do with cultural heritage collections if data has actually been aggregated. But what I'm now going to talk about right now is how do we actually get the data there to the places where we all can work with it. So my name is Larissa Borg, and I'm working at the Swedish National Heritage Board as a communications coordinator in the European Common Culture Project. What I'm working with is mostly persuading cultural heritage institutions to share their data with us, the national aggregator in Sweden for Europeana. My core question in my daily work is, how can you make your collections get to the people you want to reach? And that's why I am going to talk today about boosting your collections reach on external platforms. My question to you today is, what do we actually want to achieve with digital cultural heritage? In many cases, cases, institutions started to digitize their collections for internal use, for commercial purposes, or for being able to answer researchers' inquiries. The years of experience with digitization in the glam sector have proven that first, you cannot make money by selling digitized images. Second, researchers don't know about your content if you don't publish your collections at all or only on your own website. And third, you miss out on a lot of new additional sources of knowledge about the objects in your collections if you keep it to yourself. So if your mission as a cultural heritage institution is to serve the public, share it with others, with your community, and with people who might never be able to visit your phys physical venue. All these people might learn, new, might learn new things based on your collections, and you might learn something new too. One aspect of Caroline Glassamon's presentation last week stayed in my thoughts for a little while. You might never know how people um, actually use your content, 
And sometimes they will do things with it you would never have thought about. But that is okay. Because cultural heritage, at least the one that is in the public, public domain, belongs to all of us. And within the rules of what we as a society decide is legit, everyone should be able to use it as they like. So when we all start dreaming about what the collections could actually achieve when we open them up and let them free, what comes to your mind? Where do you, would you want to see your collections? Who should they meet? I want to give you three examples of encounters the collections in SOC, the Swedish National Aggregator to Europeana, made in the last year during the Europeana Common Culture Project. The reality in many cultural heritage institutions today is digitization efforts are project-based and funded likewise. An example from our network is the Van de Municipality, which received funding for digitizing their photography archives. They now have around 2,000 high-resolution images that document the area's heritage, especially when it comes to industrial heritage. They had project funding for um, exactly digitizing their, their um, cultural heritage um, collections. But after the person in charge left, um, after the project ended, that was it for the newly, digit, uh, newly created digital resources. So let's be honest, in an ideal cultural heritage sector, it would be best if institutions would do their own digital engagement work. But at the same time, we all know in many small sized institutions, that's far from being the reality. So for me, Vando Municipality is a best practice example for why we should share digital collections on external platforms. From the moment they started sharing their content with us at SOC and Europeana in 2019, their con content started showing up everywhere, literally. Um, so their content has been used in Europeana's industrial heritage campaign last year. And here you see an entry from the Give It Up contest in 2019, created by Linda Rose, who mixed up two of their digitized images. So even if you don't have the resources to make people engage with your content online, rely on networks that make it easier for people to find it share it and allow, and allow for new encounters. Whether it's research, editorial content or users creating new stuff with your data, let your data find new digital connections. One of the most striking experiences in the last year during the ECC project was when we created formats that connected collections and objects that would never meet in the physical place. An article of mine, for example, for the Europeana Industrial Heritage Season focused on women's work history and linked seven collections to one another. In January, it already had more than 3,000 visits. The important thing is, when I as a user research digital heritage objects, it doesn't matter how big the uh, collection is, how, mu how much reputation the institution has. All it matters is that I find the right content at the right time. I won't find your website because I probably, probably don't even know about your institution or about the objects in your collections. But I know Wikimedia, I know Europeana, so let your data find new friends there. What you see here is how often our SOC data partners collections were used during last year's industrial heritage season in Europeana's editorial content. What you see there is that it's often the openly licensed content, the higher resolution data that's being reused. But what you also see is that it isn't necessarily the big collections only that are being picked up. It's those that are relevant to the specific topic. What you heard during Hugo and Albin's talks is that when data is aggregated, it can be part of a bigger story. We're only at the beginning of exploring how cultural heritage data can be enriched by AI and how it can inform research on machine learning, just as Albin also said. So if your collections stay with you and are not part of networks and aggregation services and communities such as Wikimedia or Europeana, and if they cannot, cannot be accessed via APIs, then they simply won't be part of those journeys. So those encounters with researchers, users and developers will tell different stories about your collections. We all come with other perspectives. We see different things when we look at art, at objects and at our shared her heritage. But isn't that the beauty of it, of our contemporary world, that we allow for new perspectives and interpretations? So thank you very much. And uh, of course, get in touch with me or my colleagues at SOC um, if you want to collaborate on boosting your collections reach together. Thank you, Teresa. So should you uh, stop 
sharing the screen. Great. Uh, yeah, I think you made some really good points here. Is uh, and I'm speaking myself from sort of a background in in research as well. Uh, you want to find something when you need it at the easiest convenience, and you can't access a lot of different sites uh, or websites or even knowing that they exist. And it's quite interesting. For instance, I was wondering when you showed, as you pointed out, even very small institutions can have a rather big reach. The, the smaller ones that have managed to break through uh, in our statistics, apart from the fact that it's uh, open content that is easily shared, that you can be free to share it. Have, what else have they sort of done to, or is it that uh, they've been highlighted on European collections or I was thinking about Eribiru, Lens Museum, other, other what, what, what sort of happened there? So um, I think um, if there are different strategies, if you want to boost your um, content's reach and that really is a different when it comes to different platforms. So when you want to boost your region Europeana, for example, I can uh, post the link to the Europeana publishing framework in the chat because Europeana kind of filters um, their collections after their own data quality definitions. So that um, applies to, for example, um, resolution or um, certain types of metadata requirements. Um, licenses and so on. But it's a totally different strategy if you go to, for example, to Wikimedia and upload your um, collections on Wikimedia collections. There, diff uh, there would be other um, aspects that could be relevant um, there. So if you, for example, have teams or um, like the um, Staatens Museum for Kunst um, in Copenhagen, that also have um, Wikimedia volunteers who are writing Wikipedia articles using the exact collection objects. So then you can make sure that it is being shown in Wikipedia articles. Mm -hmm. So there are really different um, aspects. And I wanted to, to come back to a point that you just made. So um, it's not only about researchers not on, not finding um, the content that might that, that might exist somewhere in the world. It's also also about knowledge barriers. What we create when we just publish um, content on only one website and not um, making it as easy as possible for the user to find it, we kind of rely on people's knowledge that they know about existing platforms. Um, and that's just not the case. So for example, I'm researching for, at the moment about a so-called female impersonator um, for Pride Month. And because I know about Europeana, I of course went first there and I knew about, okay, I know that museum has a collection about it. But then almost at the end of my article, I was like, okay, wait, but he went also to the US for a tour um, and gave concerts there. So my, I might actually look into DPLA, uh, so the Digital Public Library of America, um, to search for content. And there was something, but just because of my knowledge of, that these services exist, I would actually go there and we can't, count on our societies and our communities to actually know that. Mm. No, so, uh, yeah, and, and that is also like knowing what kind of terminology you want to use as well uh, when you're searching for something that you brought up. Exactly. Um, but, uh, so what, what I was thinking about, uh, we've been talking, and you've been talking now because it's easier to work with organizations like museums, they have the collections. but. Could, do you think that researchers can do more about but when they are when they are looking into uh, collections or or certain topics? Can they do more to help highlight as part of their project the the content that they have found and that they have uh, the new information that they have? Uh, could, could they also be be better at working with the outreach? Uh, for these kinds of communities as well. Do you so have I think, any? Um, so my opinion, it would start to make a difference is if I would actually be able to reuse and find the objects uh, researchers use in their publications. So whether it's mm -hmm. online or in print, so that, for example, I learned quite late in my studies about Europeana, but it would have helped me and especially friends of mine who studied art history to know that those services exist. So you should implement um, 
teaching students in university is about those kind of resources. And that's, of course, something that um, researchers also do. They teach also yeah. in many cases. Um, apart from that, I would love to uh, have a more um, common, common understanding about how we actually um, um, write down the sources for our digital sources in, in, in research publications. So that it's not only, oh, they used a nice image there or an, an interesting source, but okay, I don't know how to access it. But if they actually um, say that I found this source on Europeana, um, exactly. then that might be really helpful. Yeah, or, or any kind. Yeah, I think that's a good point, really. I, I feel that myself, but we don't have a good routine or practice on. Uh, so, for instance, if I show an image, I say, yeah, this is this artwork, and maybe I write down and it belongs to a national museum. But how that the fact that this is actually available digitally somewhere should also be something that should be become second nature to researchers. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so we have a question for comment from Magnus Selya here. Uh, I think linked data is the key to good metadata and good collections. Uh, is there other good places to communicate with culture institutions more than Twitter? Well, I think um, so first of all, I would um, I like to think that um, Twitter is is one of the platforms that we uh, that many people in the sector use. But just like when I said, like okay. Um, we create barriers when we um, when there's only a small community knowing about aggregation services and their platforms. Twitter is kind of the th same thing. It was only in my master's that um, 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 a university lecturer actually told us about, okay, you guys are not on Twitter, but I would actually um, tell you to do so. <laughs> and these are the relevant hashtags to follow. Um, yeah, and so, yeah, and I think that sometimes it's very easy when you're in the bubble. Uh, it's very nice and easy, but usually it's not the best way. If you really want to communicate and work with museums, you sort of have to look to: can you find projects? Can you start crowds out? Uh, can you work with local organizations yeah. uh, and things like that? It's all. Everyone is very has a lot to do in little time, uh, so sometimes you just have to be sort of patient. Uh, but as you said, that once uh, uh, do, getting collections online means that you don't have to do all the heavy lifting yourself. Other people out there can actually help you and contribute to it. So that's a really yeah. good uh, thing. And Anna Svensson has uh, pointed out that uh, uh, permanent, uh, for citing the permanent identifiers and objects and collection levels are, are very good. And I, I agree with that, but sometimes it's quite difficult for me uh, when I download, uh, I, I would love a program when I download images because I get an image and I get the, the file name, but I, of course I don't get the metadata uh, with the image. Yeah. So I need to, be, uh, uh, or, or where it, the, the, I have to save somewhere, where is, the, where is the permanent link that I got this from if I want to use this. Uh, so I probably have to use a sort of citation uh, software to make sure that I add that in. Um, I use sometimes I use Google uh, reverse search <laughs> to try to find where I found an image. Uh, but it's uh, can also always help to use Internet Archive if you want yeah. to um, use your sources for a longer time and you want to make sure that people are still able able to find it, um, especially when it comes to research publications. Yeah. So I think this kind of what you said, what we should expect or what we should wish for from researchers and from research communities is like, think about who you want to reach and um, how you can make it actually long term available. And I mean, that's a challenge we all as a sector have to take on. And um, hmm. really. Uh, so Anna? Do you have, uh, I can just say before I put in Anna here, uh, we got one question from Lars uh, Lundqvist after Hugo's presentation. Um, and uh, so it was for you, Hugo. Uh, he wondered what is going to happen to this service in the future. Um, but I didn't have time. So it, it, will, be <coughs> it will continue to, 
to be available uh, as the project partners will, uh, at least for two years, will we'll keep it running. Uh, but also other other forms of funding will be uh, looked into to continue it to continue the, um, the besides the further development and improving the the functionality also keeping it live and and this will also is expected to soon be um more integrated to be european so on that end we'll also guarantee of uh, to find ways of of keeping it uh, live and sustainable. Yes. So, uh, Anna, uh, you can join us now for some concluding remarks. Hello. I have made. I have. I, I am in Umeå. So, if you start uh, hearing drilling, it's because at Umeå University we are going through summer um, refurbishments. But I have made some notes that I would like to share with you. First of all, I should say that uh, Hugo's discussion sort of made me think, and I don't know if everybody feels this way, about the importance of infrastructures on stepping on things that already exist. Uh, and also sort of like stepping onto communities that already exist. And with uh, Albin's uh, excellent talk also, uh, I think it's quite interesting to see what are the data limitations for AI, and especially sort of like the complexity that we have, because when people collected things, so the heterogeneous wording, extensive descriptions and bounding box, box data, when people collected in the 20s and 30s, I can tell from experience, they, they didn't, you know, they didn't think like machines. And, and we don't think they're either yet. Um, I mean, yes, sure, there's all this science fiction that, you know, robots can do fantastic things, but is it, if they can't really perform all uh, complicated tasks because the, the, the way we think and the way we organize and the trends we use in assembling things as humans are, are completely organic and, and different uh, in context. And I think I have to say that uh, when it comes to the talks today, I think it transpires that humans, uh, the human complexity of this, the technical complexity of this, the infrastructural complexity of this, and, and, and what can actually be done and, and why. And that's, that, I think, is a really interesting question that we can see on the second session. That's all I, I had to say. I, I don't know if anyone has uh, other comments. And if you can listen to me, in, I, there's no drilling now, which, which is a familiar comment. No, it worked fine. So I wondered if uh, Albin or Hugo or Larissa have some final comment before we take a break. No? I, have a, I have a small yeah. final comment, as yeah. Anna mentioned uh, that they didn't think about this in the 20s and I think it's very important that we continue not to think about it today because we don't want to drive research with the technology challenges we have. We need to have researchers stay independent from this and we have to separate them from the technical challenges. It would be very problematic if we draw this type of research because we want to do technical application on top of that. It should be the opposite way around. Uh -huh. That's a really good I think, point. I think I would actually like to agree with that because um, I think what we um, always have to keep in mind and that's where um, an issue in our sector um, comes to mind is that digital is not a buzzword. Uh, digital is being used in our sector as exact and exactly um, the sense I'll be mentioned, um, it, like digital, the great new thing, um, the, the sparkly new um, interesting. Um, ways of interacting with um, collections, and that's just not that, that's just not the case. Um, it uh, we have to find meaningful ways of engaging people in new ways with new perspectives on our collections, and breaking those barriers that have been existing since cultural heritage institutions um, have been founded. Um, and that's the challenge: not um, applying shiny new things on them. That's a very good final word.